Well, I think that AI will not replace developers. I'm sure about that, or at least semi-senior or senior developers. But all the companies, all the, all the technological companies will, will have to understand how to use AI. On the other hand, I, I think that nobody knows how AI will impact because it's, it's something really, really new, but we all know that we have to do something because our business yeah. are uh, in danger. Um, you have to use it, no, so it's there. You, you, yeah. yeah, it's there. It's something really big. But it's like feeling or, or that uh, yeah. gut feeling that, that said that uh, now that we have Excel, uh, uh, accountants will disappear. Mm -hmm. They didn't disappear. And the same mm -hmm. will happen with AI. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Ignite podcast. Today, we're delighted to have Roger Einstos on the program. He's the founder and CEO of Brantley, which helps companies offshore talent, uh, particularly engineering talent to LATAM. Welcome to the program. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Would love to get an intro from you for the audience. Cool. Cool. Well, uh, my name is Roger. I'm 35. I was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, where I lived. I started coding when I was 15 at high school. And then I started working as a developer in different companies and eventually co-founded my current company, Brainly, and that was 12 years ago, mostly 13, so such a long time. And our mission basically is uh, connecting talent from Latin America with companies in the States. So we we say that we are a kind of bridge because we give the chance for American companies to get access to talent in Latin America. And we also get the chance uh, to that talent in Latin America to get those uh, big opportunities in North America. Yeah, what, what I like about this idea is, you know, as some, somebody built a lot of products with offshore engineering teams. And typically the world is so interconnected now that, you know, I've worked with teams in China, LATAM, Africa, Europe, India, obviously, basically every continent. And... What I like about LATAM is the the time zone, right? Like if you're on the West Coast or East Coast, it's usually it's been a few hours. So you'd have a lot of overlapping time. The challenge with working with China, I remember when I worked at Microsoft, we had, had a team in China, is they came online at like 4 or 5 p.m. You know, we're at the end of our day. It's kind of dinner time. The kids have basketball practice or whatever, soccer practice. And, and uh, you're like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to take this call from a holding chair on the side of the, you know, the field here. Maybe you could speak more to those challenges. India is even worse. You know, like at least those guys are like, hey, it's 12 hour time difference. Like whatever, we're just going to jump on the call at you know, 1 a.m. our time. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the of the key things of working with, with LATAM, with Latin America. If you're based in the East Coast, you have basically the same time zone. For instance, Argentina is only one hour ahead of Eastern time. So you have your, your full day overlap with your team and if you are based in the west coast we are only four hours ahead so you have at least half of the day shared with with your team and that make things easier uh, that that that's true uh, it's difficult to find people that know how to work remote and even more in a sign mode so if you have at least half of your day overlap make uh, things uh, start uh, to be easier for the day-by-day -day work, basically. Yeah, exactly. Well, maybe you could walk us back to the beginning. I mean, you briefly t touched on your, your history and background, but maybe you can tell us about, like, what was that aha moment for you founding Brantley? At, at what point you were like, oh, this, this, is, this makes sense. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this. Well, I would say that when I started working as a developer, I didn't know at that time that I wanted to build something, to build a company, to be an entrepreneur. But eventually I realized when I was working for my second company, not mine, for my second job, um, I realized that there were a huge need of merging these two worlds. This big opportunity that we had and we still have in Latin America and the need uh, from from companies in the States to hire those kind of talents. So that was a moment 
when we started thinking, okay, we have to do something with this. We know how to write code. We know about hiring engineers. We know about uh, creating digital products. So this is the perfect moment to start thinking about creating a company. But I think that we, we started it because we wanted to be entrepreneurs. We wanted to feel the freedom. And we also felt the need to make things happen because we are doers. We like execution. And we, we thought and we felt that working for others' company, uh, accomplishing that goal was going to be difficult. So that's why we started and we say, okay, the, there is a necessity and we, we have the skills to do it. So why not? Let's start. And we started. Yeah, I love that. Maybe you could give us an overview of Brantley, you know, services, value prop, all that stuff. Yeah. But like I told you, we connect talent from Latin America with companies in, in the US. And our main goal is to make working with talent in Latin America as seamless as it is in the US. So based on that, we have a lot of experience working with early stage startups, seed, pre-seed, series A and B startups. And we also have a lot of experience working with SMBs companies in the States, like bootstrap companies that that maybe they are not in the startup ecosystem, let's say. Um, we mostly help them building their teams in Latin America. So for instance, a typical case is, is a company that, that already has uh, a technical team, maybe a CTO or a VP of engineering, some developers, and they want to make that team grow, but they want to make it like uh, cost effective. So that's why most of them have tried with India, with uh, Ukraine, and time zone is the main thing that they they uh, just faced. Yeah, it's really tough. So in this time, Latin America, it's, it's emerging like a new hub of not only developers, developers, marketing, sales, design, many things. So we, we uh, define ourselves like your team in Latin America. So we have our, our company in the States or like our entity. So our clients basically are uh, hiring an American company, but they are getting access to talent in Latin America and they just need to focus on the project, on the business, on execution of their business. And they don't have to take care of hiring, retention, how to uh, find the right uh, developer, the right engineer for the right project, the right position. So we put all our experience uh, on the table, working with these kind of startups, founders, and companies in general for all over these years. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And you know, and I'm thinking about like, at what point does it make sense for my startups, right? You know, like if you're a founder of a pre-seed, seed, Series A, you know, and you're you're looking for talented engineers, at what point do you kind of go, you know, what we should spin up one of the t- one team, at least one scrum team. I don't know if people still do scrum anymore, but one scrum team, you know, uh, like in LATAM, at what point does that make sense? Well, we, we have many of our clients, I would say that they started like an early stage startup, maybe with us building the MVP, being the, a kind of CTOs. And a couple of years later, they raised money. They had the need to build their own team, their internal team. So we helped them build their team because they trust us because we uh, went with them through that path of creating the, the, the little baby, the digital product the company. And most of the times we ended up being like a workforce for them. We start working with them, creating the MVP, then we help them figure it out how to create or build or hire a hire, sorry, uh, their internal team. And we just then assign developers uh, like a, in a staffing mode or staff organization mode because they find value in us being partners, being advisors, helping them uh, solve like technological problems in general. So uh, that's a really uh, like a common uh, case study that usually happens to us. Yeah, so I'm, t- I'm putting my CFO hat on for a sec, right? So like you're going to your CFO. So it's probably series A or B because they probably don't have CFO before that. And you're the VP of Eng, right? 
And you're basically trying to make this case to CFO, like, hey, I got this great company, Brantley. I can spin up a dev team. What does that ROI look like? How do you convince your CFO? You know, imagine you're giving advice to the VP of engineering to go pitch the CFO to kind of sell this thing. Well, basically we have a metric that we know that in most of our clients, they are saving around 350K a year. I mean, the same team that they are hiring with us in Latin America, let's suppose a small team, full-time developer, uh, like fractional quality analyst uh, guy and a fractional project manager, like the basic team, small team, they save around 350K a year. Which is what, 50%? Uh, less, it's about half off? No, 350,000 a year. Yeah, which is what, half uh, half the cost, one third of the cost? Oh, uh, yeah, it's up, up to 60% approximately, yeah, on average. Okay, yeah, 50, 60% less. And, and, and you would argue to your CFO, like, these are equivalent engineers that we could hire here for basically half the cost. Yeah, and, and it's amazing talent. For instance, in Argentina, we rank top one when it comes to English skills, we have one of our universities that are in the top 10% of best universities in the world. We are the country in Latin America with most uh, unicorns. And since the macroeconomic uh, context that we face in Latin America in general, but especially in Argentina, uh, that macroeconomic context taught us how to be more creative, more resilient, and how to make things happen despite the context. So that's something really different that that talent from Latin America have, and you will not find in Ukraine or in India. Probably. Well, in Ukraine, they're all on the on the line, right? Like they're all there are more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where? Yeah. Right now, they are not going f- through a, like a good situation, uh, but but it's something really different from talent. I think there's something there's something lost a little bit with a remote team versus being in person. I think. Uh, but everybody's gone remote, you know, especially in the last four years since COVID. But I think there's so much more lost when you're in different, t- like you're more than five or six time zones away. When you start talking to people in Europe, eight, nine, ten time zones away, just it, you know, I, I just got back from Greece. I, I went there and with my family, and I was still working on on Team Ignite, you know, uh, every day by the pool with my laptop out, and it was hard because it's a ten year or I'm sorry, ten year, ten hour time difference. It's just it's so hard to overcome. Yeah, and you lose the day-by-day interaction. I mean, just doing a joke in Slack or having a team-building activity. But for instance, most of our clients once a year come to Argentina just to meet the team. I've, I've been to LATAM to visit my engineering team in Chile, actually. Well, yeah, the same. We, we have a client that came uh, in January and he spent here two months January and February, and he told me, hey, you should include as a part of the onboarding, spending a month with a team. And obviously it's difficult because it's a lot of money, but it's something that really changed the, the, the thing, the way. You build the relationship. Uh, we interact, build a relationship that it's very, very important behind working with a team because at the end of the day, we are all human beings that needs to have something to trust i'm still in touch with my remote teams these are remote teams i worked with for years at various companies ukraine india china uh latam like they're we're still connected on linkedin i still follow their their updates and like you know they're they're friends and colleagues and it's a uh, pretty cool so when you when you engage with a company how long is the engagement pro- uh, process typically is it like a six month contract 12 month contract is it month to month yeah it's uh, like a month to month, but we work with low commitment. We call it low commitment because the only commitment that we uh, require for our clients, it's an initial three month commitment. But after that, it's like a no endless contract, but you can terminate the contract if you want. But give us 90 days to ramp up and show you our value. Yeah. Yeah. But after that, you if you want to terminate the contract, you just to you just have to notify us with a month uh, in advance, and we believe that you uh, have to work with us because you like us and we are a valuable partner for you, and not because we are in jail with us. But our normal lifetime value is more than two years, three years, because since we are doing staffing, most of our clients are always growing and growing. 
And that's something that changed because many years ago, we used to work only with very, very early stage startups and lifetime value was a year, a year and a half. So most of them have uh, difficulties to raise more money. Oh, they half of them go out of business, the early stage ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's why a couple of years we make, we made, sorry, kind of pivot with that. And we started focusing on um, more uh, like Series A or bootstrap companies. So you have a like longest, uh, a longer lifetime value. Very cool. So uh, tell, walk us through the vetting process. I would imagine it's it's kind of one challenging when somebody rolls off, right? A startup kind of cancels their contract. And then all of a sudden you got three, four, five talented engineers you got to find a new place for. How do you kind of manage that kind of churn? Well, that's probably the the worst part of the business, because if you if you have an amazing engineer, you want to find the right project for for them. And sometimes it's part of the business that you have a contract that just ends because the company went out of business or whatever. So we always try to reorganize those. Uh, like free people and assign people to existing projects or to new projects. It, it's a true that sometimes it's impossible. So you have to let some people go and it's always, always sad. But over the years, we understood that it's part of the game that you, you have to, to, to play. But when we have good people, we try to find the right place for them. No matter if we have to lose some profit on the way. Because we understand that that person gave us so much over years, month, or whatever, or whatever. So maybe that uh, tough time is a moment for us to show them, okay, we are here for you, and and we want to to uh, keep this relationship going because we know that maybe we are going through a bad situation right now because of the market or whatever, but we will see the light at the end of the of the tunnel so it, it's part of the game and it's something that you have to you you, sh, you must understand how to deal with because at the end of the of the day it's dealing and leading people yeah yeah that totally makes sense so t- uh, talk us through your vetting process how do you find these talented engineers and make sure that they're actually good at what they say they're good at that's that's an an interesting point we have different First of all, we, we not only uh, vet uh, hard skills, but also soft skills, because we are convinced that it's not enough to be uh, a, a ninja, like we say, calling. You have to know how to talk with a teammate or with a project manager or with a leader or whatever. So you can be the best uh, developer in the world, but if you don't have some soft skills, you will never be a senior developer, or at least for us, or, 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 or approach. So based on that, we have a process that usually takes two to three steps. The first step is having an interview with, with my co-founder and our COO. Uh, and in that, um, that meeting, that interview, the first thing that we do is not only understand the experience of the candidate, but also understand if there, there is like a cultural fit. Because as I told you, if you don't have cultural fit, the rest of the thing will be impossible. So it, it's not the right fit for Brainly or for our clients, someone who only knows how to code, but don't know how to be in a company working uh, like a teammate. So that's the first step. After that, we have a challenge that uh, it's public. It's in our website. We have different challenge depending on the technology. It's not the same the challenge for React.js. React Native, Node.js, .NET, or whatever. And we empower them to do that challenge using AI because we understand that AI is a reality. And, and I personally believe that people that don't start using AI will disappear or will be replaced by AI. But if you know and you learn how to start using that powerful tool, you will be part of the of the change. So we empower them to use AI because we also want to see how 
they use it. And after that, they have, so the second step is a challenge. And the, and the last one is uh, like um, a technical interview with our VP of engineer engineering to defend the challenge. So you can uh, solve the challenge using JetGPT or GitHub Copilot in an hour, but that's not the key. The key is how you will defend the solution that you did, the code. So all of that process is in English. We hire most of our people in Argentina, but since the very first interview is in English because we need them to effectively communicate in English because they will be working with, with companies in the States. Um, so with all of those steps, we assure that the person is not only the right fit from the cultural point of view, but also from the soft and hard uh, point of view and uh, for instance to share with you a metric in the last year and a half we have like a like a hiring radio of 100 percent. so all the people that we hired and we assigned to a project worked nobody asked us to change the the person so that's because of our process and that's because we have been hiring developers for 15 years so we learned how to fill them from the very first conversation. Obviously, we can fail because we are human beings too, but we have a proven process that works. So, yeah, that's amazing. Talk us through some of the, I mean, you talked a little bit about, yeah, I got to be able to speak English. What are some of the cultural things you need to educate people on as they're dealing with people in the States? Like, what do you find are common things you're like, hey, here's like two or three things or five things that you need to know about dealing with Americans, you know? I like, I like that question. Um, we shared a lot of, of things when it comes to uh, work culture. So that's, that's good. And we also grew up watching, uh, really, really, we, we are really immersed in, in American culture because. Yeah. You watch all the same TV shows and movies and all that stuff. Yeah. Same. We grew up watching the same TV shows, movies, etc. So we are really into the into the culture. But if I had to say the biggest thing that that we as Argentinian have to change is that we we should be maybe more pragmatic. You know that many times when 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 someone asks you questions, we like to uh, give explanations, and we ended up going for different topics. Uh, maybe it's happening to me right now in this podcast. And when you work with 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 um, with, uh, with uh, U.S. companies, they are like more uh, pragmatic, more accurate. Yeah, it's like get, yeah, be concise, be direct. Just go to the point. Yeah, just get to the point. Yeah. Over the years, I understood that if I go to the states, I usually go five, six times a year, and I have lunch with a client. It's it's normal to have an, an hour lunch. And that's not because uh, they don't love you. It's because uh, it's, it's the time. They want to get back to work. Yeah. Yeah. In Argentina, if you come to Argentina and are a client and we have uh, for lunch, we will cook you an asado and we'll drink wine and, and maybe we will spend four hours in a lunch. Then the coffee, the coffee after the coffee. So... Those little things are, are, are things that you have to change, but the other ones, we are pretty, pretty similar. Yeah, it's like a business lunch here. It's like a power lunch. And then in Argentina, like a lunch is an event. This is going to be, we're going to hang out for hours and, and really immerse exactly each other. Yeah. But on the other hand, on the other hand, it's something I discovered that most of our clients really enjoy when they come and they uh, enjoy with the team or with us. Uh, going for lunch, uh, cooking an asado. Uh, most of the times I, I enjoy uh, cooking an asado. I really love cooking asado. So I, I usually cook asado for them and they enjoy the, I know, the magic of just starting the fire, drinking a, a, a glass of wine, enjoying the tradition of, of cooking a, an asado. So, but yeah, we are pretty similar. Yeah, Americans are upset if their McDonald's takes a few extra minutes, right? It's like I ordered a cheeseburger and I want it right right now so I can get back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Let's back to the, uh, let's go to the thing. Yeah. That's so funny. 
So how do you see, speaking of AI, I mean, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, like, how do you see it impacting uh, your business? You know, um, it, do, you, do you see a, a higher quantity demanded? Obviously, we, we're in macroeconomic headwinds here. You know, funding slowed down a bit, especially early stage, unless it's an AI company. How do you feel it's impacting your business with the AI co-pilot you mentioned and, and other things? Well, I think that uh, AI will not replace developers. I'm sure about that, or at least semi-senior or senior developers. But all the companies, all the, all the technological companies will, will have to understand how to use AI. On the other hand, I, I think that nobody knows how AI will impact because it's, it's something really, really new. But we all know that we have to do something because our business are uh, in danger. Yeah, you have to use it, so it's there, yeah. Yeah, it's there, it's something really big, but it's like feeling or or that uh, yeah, gut feeling that that said that uh, now that we have Excel, uh, uh, accountants will disappear. They didn't disappear, and the same will happen with AI. But you have to understand how to use it as a powerful tool, because otherwise you will disappear as a professional or as a company. I think probably one of the, yeah, one of the, one of the best analogies is like agriculture, right? You know, two, 250 years ago, uh, most people were working on farms, right? 80, 90% of people were on food production and now it's like two or 3%. So it's not like farming went away. Um, but the farmers that remained got bigger, better, faster, and more efficient, I think with software, with AI, it's interesting, right? Because, you know, and maybe you could talk to this. This is kind of part of the question I was trying to get to, which is right now on the ground, how do you see it impacting the business? Not in the future. I, we talk about the future. I love talking about the future, but like, like as, as you, is it making your developers more efficient? Is it making kind of the junior developers more senior? Like, how do you see it kind of like anecdotally impacting your development shop? We don't work a lot with, with junior developers. Uh, but I don't think that they are getting more senior, but the ramp up, it, it, it's getting faster because they don't have to, uh, some, some skill that you need as a developer is know how to Google something. It sounds weird, but it's a reality. If you don't know how to Google things, it's uh, more difficult to be a good developer. So I think ChatGPT, for instance, uh, make that easier. So it's easier to ask for uh, an error, like I'm receiving this error, ask the error to ChatGPT instead of going to Google. So yeah, copy paste the code in, yeah, yeah. So that's why it's getting easier for for uh, for junior developers. You can get to the answer faster. Yeah, and, and the right answer with examples. Uh, and it, it gives you one answer. And if you don't like it, you can go for another one. You don't have like a, a list of potential answers, a forum that you have to start reading. So it's obviously faster because you have one one answer to start uh, testing it and you don't have to surf into a notion of different answers. But when it comes to senior, so to semi-senior and senior developers, uh, which are all kind of developers, the thing that we realize is, is that we are having less friction with with from the operational point of view. The other day I was talking with my co-founder who is in charge of the operation of the company and he told me I'm realizing that since ChatGPT was released we have uh, we um, uh, we have less problems and that's why all the people are using ChatGPT and things that uh, that a year ago or a year and a half ago used to be a big problem that maybe involves two, three, or five uh, people in a team. So everybody is investing time in solving one problem. Now they can they can solve it using ChatGPT. So that's why the whole team is getting more and more productive. On the other hand, we are also using GitHub Copilot that gives you like an enormous advantage when it comes to think solutions, think architectures. So you still need the senior developer approach to understand if that uh, solution that the AI is proposing you 
makes sense or not for, for the business, for the problem that you are trying to solve. But you can do it much better. So we are faster. We are coding faster. We are delivering better code. And we are experimenting less problems than we than a year and a half ago. How do you how do you create a culture between kind of the the client and and your teams? Like how do you break down those barriers and create the connections? Besides, you know, the obvious, like you know, flying them down to Argentina for a month or two, like from a day day to day, week to week kind of remote work basis. Like, what's that structure look like? Yeah, that's one of the 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 challenges that we have. But we believe that culture is how we work. I mean, culture is not only going for a beer, which we enjoy and we can do it when, when a client comes to Argentina and it's great, but it's also the way we work. Being on time to a meeting uh, with your, your task done, uh, giving visibility about the task that you're working on. So... The way we work, the methodologies we use, and the cultural alignment we find between the right fit for the right project, the right client, creates the culture. So I wouldn't say that we do something like specific, like we do this activity to improve the culture or the chemistry between the client and the developer, but we always try to find the developer that it's good for the client. That's why we like to understand the business model of the client, the, the, the way of thinking, not only that, hey, I need two developers. Okay, we are not a factory. We are your team in Latin America. So since we are your team, we want you to get the best of the best. So we, we, are, we are strongly believers that culture is how we work and not the, the rest of the things, or at least 80% of the, of the culture is how we work. And we try to facilitate that uh, thing. Obviously that when they can come to Argentina or we go to the States, it's easier because you, you have that face-to-face -face contact. But as, as you told me, the world is going remote and it's something that it's happening, it has been happening. So it's part of the of the barriers that are just uh, going down so we have to adapt as we are adapting to ai we are we also have to adapt to this new reality that we have since covid more than ever yeah that makes sense what's your vision for brantley in the next uh, 5 or 10 years you've already been at this for almost 15 uh yeah who are, where are you going to be in 5 or 10 years yeah 10 years it's a lot <laughs> I don't know, but for, for the next five years, we want to keep growing, obviously, but in a more exponential uh, way so we can keep helping. We, we, we truly believe in this opportunity that companies in the States uh, have. So we want to keep growing. We want... It, it, I mean, uh, selling the company, doing an exit or not, it's something that we are discussing because if we want to sell the company in five or six years, we have to start working on that right now. It's a plan. It's not something that just happened that someone just arrived and say, hey, I want your company. I want to give you uh, 10 million, 20 million, whatever. So, so our first approach for the next five years is keep growing, but in a healthy way with healthy clients, with a long-term clients. That's why we changed our approach to eventually ended up selling the company and giving the opportunity to, to those two parts of the story, the companies hiring talent and people in Latin America that want to have a salary in dollars and, and want to have an opportunity working for abroad, connecting them to, to those companies. I love it. Uh, why don't we switch to a rapid fire? I'll say a question and you just give a quick response. Uh, I didn't get you. Rapid fire question. Um, I'll, I'll say a question. You just give me your first thought. Um, what's the best piece of advice you ever received? Let, let's, uh, let's travel more to the States. Let, let, let's be more involved in, in that ecosystem. How do you start your day? Uh, going to a gym. What's one book you recommend to every entrepreneur? Thinking fast and slow. Um, if you could have dinner with any historical figure, who would it be and why? 
Dead or alive? Michael Jordan, I think. I love that. <laughs> You're a basketball fan? I don't know, but I like the approach that he has and, and the way he he leads. Did you watch the uh, documentary on Netflix, the, the, the Last Dance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Last Dance, yeah. I watch it. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite... What's your favorite productivity tool or app? To do list. In one word, how would you describe your leadership style? Friendly. Uh, what's the most pa- challenging part of your job? Convince uh, people that they need to give Latin America a chance. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite hobby outside of work? Traveling. Uh, if you weren't in tech, what industry would you be in? Uh, that's a good one. Um, construction, I think. Oh, that's fun. I always wanted to build skyscrapers. I thought that'd be really cool. Um, what's one piece of technology you can't live without? My iPhone. How can um, potential customers and partners get in touch with you? Through LinkedIn. I think that my name will be probably in the episode, so through LinkedIn, or getting into our webpage. It's brainly.com. I'm also on Twitter, but it's like not, not a professional social uh, network for me. So LinkedIn is the best way. I'm really active on LinkedIn. You usually struggle with that too, because twi- on Twitter, I almost always have this professional persona, but a personal one. I, I thought about creating two, one that's like te- more, more my Team Ignite stuff and one that's just more of like me complaining about the Warriors or something like that. <laughs> the thing is that if I, I believe that in Twitter, you have to be like uh, your life has to be in Twitter. So you have to be on Twitter your whole day. And that's something I can do. So that's why I prefer LinkedIn. I don't like LinkedIn because there is full of people talking about things, but I try to be really transparent. That's my style. And that, that's my way of, of, of thinking the social network. I just want to share my experience on some value. Yeah. Well, Roger, thanks so much for coming on. I uh, really enjoyed the conversation. I'm sure lots of founders out there listening will. Uh, we'll get a, a lot of insights on on hiring a a, a firm like yours. Thanks so, uh, so much for coming on. Thank you so much for hiring me.